Well, good morning, church. We are so glad to be worshiping with you today, whether you're physically here in the room with us or you're watching at home online. We just want to spend some time in the presence of God, worshiping, praising his holy name. We're seeking him this morning just for a breakthrough that only he can give. The odds stacked against me. I'm surrounded on all sides. But I've heard you can part the waters. So in your name, come and turn the tides. I'm staring at this mountain. Staring at the smell No chance I'm getting through But I've heard they can melt before So in your name I'm asking it to move Come on, why don't you stand up with us, sing this So let them Resting on the promises of Jesus. As long as you're in it, the story's not finished. I know you've overcome, so I know I'll overcome. As long as you're in it, the story's not finished.
sing these powerful words together. The cross stands before me. Come on, this is the truth. It's finished, it is done. Yeah, I heard you told death it was over. So in your name, I'll claim this fight is won. Amen, Father, you've won the fight. Thank you, Jesus. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Amen. Well, good morning, Northeast. All right. I can tell the sun's out because people actually responded to me today, and I, I, I can see smiles in eyes. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're joining us here uh, in the room or if you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, if you are uh, watching the stream live or uh, after the fact, uh, this is probably a good time to get those communion supplies ready. Uh, take that arm for your recliner and crank that thing back and get comfy. For those of you in the room, I'm sorry. The budget doesn't allow for recliners for everybody. It's just not, not in the cards. Uh, if you are in the room, just a reminder, keep the mask on uh, at all times until you leave the building. Um, uh, let's, let's get into some announcements. Let's put some stuff in front of you guys. Uh, so this Saturday, uh, the, what is it? 13th, right there. Okay, uh, March 13th, uh, between 10 and 1230, we're holding a seminar here for uh, loss of a spouse. Um, I think we can all agree maybe that's something that... Uh, Unless you've been through that, maybe you don't fully understand that. So if you have been through that, this is a great opportunity to get connected with people who do understand that. Uh, so that's this Saturday. Uh, we got some more details on the website. Um, yeah, uh, register now for that if you would like to. Uh, second thing I want to put you guys in front of you, uh, you can register right now for Northeast Kids Plus. So that is kind of like a family worship service that we do uh, that, that includes the whole family. Um, register for that. It's on the website. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, let us know. More details on the website. Uh, speaking of registering, uh, for next week, if you'd like to be in the room for us, um, you don't need to register. So we're making a couple different changes here. Now with the, the positivity rate kind of on the, the downward slope, we're starting to open things up a little bit more. We're making a couple changes to our Sunday morning uh, service in here, okay? So for next week, you don't need to register. Uh, just come with your family, come with your smiles. Uh, we're going to have a couple different sections. Um, kind of in the, in the middle here, there's going to be rows of chairs. Over here, it's going to be kind of what we've been familiar with for for the last couple months, right? Uh, and then over here, we're going to have some tables for families because uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I needed something to draw on while the big bald guy was talking. That's not a knock at Wayne. My dad was the pastor and he was bald. So, yeah. Love you, Wayne, wherever you are. Um, yeah, uh, so though it's, it's really just kind of seating changes. We're still going to keep social distancing. Uh, there's still going to be masks required. Um, but just to let you guys know, there are going to be some changes next week. And, and do kind of be flexible with us, right? We, we've never really done this before. So uh, if, if you come and, and things are a little, little bit frustrating, just give us a little bit more, more patience than you normally would. Okay? Uh, last thing I want to put in front of you guys uh, is the offering. Uh, if you want to give through text, if you want to give online, if you want to mail it into the mailbox, perfectly fine. If you brought it with us today, brought it with you today, there's a box on the wall over here. Uh, you can go ahead and drop that in. All right, why don't you guys stand up? We're going to keep singing.
Praise Church. I want to sing a song that we taught a few weeks ago. It's called Graves in the Gardens, that He Brings New Life. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And then you came along. But then you came along Yeah, you put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Come on, let's sing this together Oh, there's no
guys can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you, guys. Uh, here's your uh, COVID tip for the day. If you ha take your mask and you're wearing a button-up shirt with a pocket, you can do this. Now you've got a pocket square. I am the best-dressed one in the room. You can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> well, hey, guys. Uh, my name's David. Um, so a little bit about me. I grew up Baptist. Don't hold that against me. Um, but, but one of the pillars of, of the Baptist church is going to church camp, right? Um, now, I would go there every summer that I can remember. And then when I was done being a student, I would go back and I was a camp counselor there for a number of years, right? So that was ingrained within my being. It still is. Uh, every, I don't know, probably two weeks or so, all right, twice a week, there we go. Twice a week at camp, we were at a campfire nights. And at campfire night, you sing campfire songs, right? Makes sense. And one of them uh, it was it was called Cast Your Burdens, and it goes like this, because I want it stuck in your head just like it's stuck in my head. Cast your burdens upon Jesus, because he cares for you. And repeat, cast your burdens upon Jesus, because he cares for you. Thank you, Tom. So it, it's interesting to me, right? Um, uh, we're taught these kind of core biblical truths when we're young, and then they kind of evolve a little bit when, when we gain a little bit more perspective, right? Life happens, and we learn things, and we come back to that, that core truth that we were taught when we were a kid, and, and it kind of looks a little different, which is, I think, intentional, right? That's why we call the Bible the living word, right? We can go back to it, and, and it's kind of a new thing every time we read a passage, so I went back to this passage in, in 1 Peter where, where it says, cast your burdens upon Jesus because uh, he cares for you. And I, and I started looking through different translations, and, and one translation stuck out to me in, in, in particular, and it said, throw your burdens on Jesus. And I love that imagery. Because imagine this, you, you have a burden, right? And, and it's yours, it, you, you found it or, or what have you, and, and you have a choice of what to do with it. Uh, I, I can hold it. Uh, I, I can throw it over here where I might actually find it later in life. Or, or I could throw it over here uh, where someone actually might pick it up and bring it back to me and remind me of it. Or I have the option of throwing it because I don't want it anymore. I can throw it to Jesus. And I think this is important for two reasons. Number one, he can take it, right? God is all-powerful. He can take it. But also, he can take it and turn it into something that I can't. We just sang about this, right? He turns graves into gardens. He turns mourning to dancing. He turns ashes to beauty. I can't do that. So even from, from strictly an investment perspective, that's the best ROI I'm going to get is if I take this burden and throw it to God. Second point is this. My perspective on this changed when I had kids. I have two little girls. They're beautiful. I love them very much. And, and things change when you become a parent, right? In the context of this verse, I want to be the kind of parent that my kids are comfortable coming to me with the things that they're struggling with. I want them to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if they're mad, even at me, that they can come and tell me about it. And the reason I want that is because I want them to know that I, I will respond in love. And that's another biblical truth. Cast your burdens upon Jesus because he cares for you. God's response will always be love. There is no other option. So as we reflect on time of communion here today, pray with me. Uh, God, we, we thank you. No other relationship that I have here on this planet compares to the one that I have with you. 
because I know I can take anything that is weighing me down and I can throw it to you. I can throw it at you and you know what to do with it. And God, that gives me a sense of peace that I I, I can't find anywhere else. So Lord, today we we thank you for being you. We thank you for, for caring about us so much that you sent your son as a sacrifice so that we have the opportunity to take our burdens and throw them to you. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see those of you at home, even though I can't see you. I'm imagining you right now. It's probably creeping you all out. But welcome. We are in a series we're talking about love. And I, I want to talk in context of love and what David was just saying about um, us opening up. We are, we are celebrating with those of you who are getting vaccinated. More and more people are getting vaccinations all the time. And as a result, um, uh, we, we just need to make a change because... With more and more vaccinations, we can offer more opportunities for people to engage with each other. And so we want to be able to do that. So on this side of the room, there'll be still um, distance seating and that there'll just be seats of twos and threes and fours. So if you don't want people sitting up and they, up against you, if that, if that makes you a little uncomfortable still, then that, those seats are available. There'll be rows here and the rows will be six feet apart. So they'll be farther apart. But if a family wants to come with three generations and worship together, we're okay with that. And if a, if a small group wants to come and they're spending time together, like we have some of our senior groups that have all been vaccinated. And so they, they may want to come and sit all together and we, we want to make space for that. And, and then for families to sit together and still all distanced, but just giving a context for each. And we're, we're moving into a time where um, it's very difficult for us to make decisions for everybody um, so we're asking you to make a decision that's wise for you, and we're trying to provide seating options that are wise for you. And I, I want to say in the context of love here, let's not judge each other. Can we not do that? Um, we were in a, it seems like a really sensitive time where we have a tendency to maybe look at people and judge them based on their behaviors. And so I don't want any, any judgments about people that still continue to say, you know, it's, it's wise for us to continue to worship at home. You keep doing that. And we as a church are committed to make sure that the in-home experience is as good as if you're in the room. We don't think of you as second. We, we consider you to be primary too. And if you're in the room, don't judge each other based on where people sit. If people choose to remain more distant, don't judge. If somebody chooses to sit in the center section next to people that they're doing life with, let's not judge each other about that. Um, can we just agree to that, to love each other well uh, through this? I feel like we've got a few more months of this and then... Hopefully we can get out of this and I just really want to encourage you guys not uh, to judge each other to love because we're in this series right now talking about love. We went through a habit series where we're talking about things, habits and, and rhythms to life that like we can build in good habits and like the spiritual disciplines are really good habits for us to build into our life. And 
love is one of those disciplines, one of those things we choose to do. And we didn't want to just spend one week on that. We want to spend four weeks on that. And so we're in this series. And the first week I talked about the reality that God loves you. And if you are in the room or you're listening today, you need to hear this. If you don't really embrace the idea of how much you are loved by God, then you don't get it. He is crazy about you. He's incredibly gracious towards you. He gave his one and only son for you. And so we are called to love because we've been loved so much. And then last week we talked about Jesus giving a new command to his disciples that they're supposed to love each other. And by that they would be known as disciples. Like it was supposed to be the mark of who we are in Jesus. Well, today I want to dial in a little bit more. I want to zoom in because we talked about Jesus. We talked about the love of Jesus, how it was gracious and sacrificial. And, and those can be kind of like vague and, and big terms, right? You know, gracious and sacrificial. And so today I want, to, I want to zoom in on what that means. What does gracious love look like? What does sacrificial love look like? And so Paul gives us a, almost like a microscopic view of love. And so we're going to talk about that. Speaking of microscopic, I have a couple of examples of microscopic things. And I want you to guess what they are. So the first one, I'm going to pop on the screen here. This is a... A response, you guys can respond at home, I can hear you through your screens. And, um, but like, what do you think this is? Anybody? A jewel? A cell? It's probably part of a cell, yep. What? Okay, grapes? Okay, somebody said blueberries the first service. No, this is actually, this is actually COVID-19. Yeah, so while it might look like grapes, you might want to put it in your mouth, I don't suggest it, okay? Uh, I know this is like one of those, oh, Wayne, why'd you have to bring that up? Well, I'm sorry. Now the second one is a little bit more fun. What is this second one? Anybody? What's it look like? What do you think about? What could it be? Kind of creepy when you look at it. This is part of something. It, on it grows fruit that we eat. This is a tomato leaf. Would you say a kiwi? That was a good guess. Nope, this is a tomato leaf. This is a tomato leaf. Next one. This is something mechanical, something small we use. It's a tip of a ballpoint pen. Zoomed in. Okay. Next one. Something that's really pretty. So you zoom in on it. Anybody? Yeah. Not mold. No, nope, it's not a seashell. That's a really good guess. It's not a, it, this is a, a rose petal when you zoom in. Rose petal. This one here, not a fruit, not a potato chip. It is a record. Vinyl. Josie for the win. All right. This one, again, something you eat. The thought of you putting this in your mouth, right, probably freaks you out. Nope, it's not a green bean. Good guess, though. The color might throw you because it's not a typical, the color's wrong, it seems like in the picture. But when you zoom in, I guess it's right. This, what? Nope, not lettuce. This is a carrot. This is a, a close-up of a carrot. All right, final one, last one. This is. No, good guess though, because it does have wings. Something very pretty until you zoom in on it. It's a butterfly wing. These are called, these are called butterfly scales. Yes, very good guesses, guys. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. Well done. Here's my point. There are certain things that look really good until you zoom in. And there's some things that look um, even more beautiful when you zoom in. And I would say this, I would say that love in its natural native state, the way we learn it typically in our life, is pretty on the outside, but when you zoom in, it doesn't look very good. Like love in the way we learn it, the way we, we kind of naturally adapt to it, we learn to love in ways that it feels right, it feels good. It feeds something in our soul. You know, we, we grow up in adolescence and we get kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling about that special someone. And, but it's love when you zoom in on it that really isn't that attractive because 
the love that's natural and native tends to be very conditional. We learn really early on that love is something that must be earned, or at least we feel like it must be earned. And we learn that maybe in the houses we grew up in or, or the relationships we're in. That native natural love, when you zoom in, makes us feel like we have to earn it in some way, like it's conditional. It also seems very fickle. It seems something that's turned on and turned off. Something we receive and then it's gone. So marriages will start, marriages fail. Love is given, then, then love is retracted. And love in its native natural form, when you zoom in, because of its fickle nature, is not very attractive. And, and the other thing I think that we see or we learn from love when you look in like this is that it's not always trustworthy. You can't count on it. Because you don't exactly know if it's going to be there or not, it tends to be something that we, it's not real strong, it's not foundational. And, and so I do this a lot in, in talking with couples where I find that the love that they base their relationship on, it, it's not trustworthy, it's not something that they have confidence in. And so it's like they're one foot in and one foot out. And so this is what I want you to do. If you're, if you're a kid in the room, I want you to do this for me. If you're listening from home, here's what I would like you to do. If you just need something to doodle on. When you zoom in on the love of Jesus, the love like Jesus described, or that the, the you see in Jesus, the way that Jesus loved people, it wasn't conditional, it was trustworthy, it wasn't fickle, he just loves us all the time, even when we fail. What would that love look like if you were to look at that love through a microscope? I just love to see some creative ideas of what that love would look like when you look at it through a microscope. So if you're a kid or you're an adult and you need to do something to keep your mind going as you listen to me, do that. Here's, here's what I want to talk about. The love of Jesus, when, when, when we're going to read today, the, the passage we're going to read today is, is about the love of Jesus. And I want you to get this, that the love of Jesus, when you zoom in on it, is really a beautiful thing. It's really a beautiful thing. And this kind of love, according to Paul, should be found in everything we do. This kind of love is to be found in everything we do. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 is where I'm going to start reading. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then he goes into this description. He's talking about the church and he's talking about gifting and he's talking about all the things that, you know, that, that are just awesome in the church about the way God gifts us, and the way we, he, he knits us together. And then he says, but I want to tell you the most excellent way. And then he goes into this description, um, talking almost like in the first person, of describing like the ultimate church person. Like the ultimate person in the kingdom. And this is how he says, if I speak of the tongues of men and of angels. In other words, if I can speak in heavenly languages, I'm so gifted. But I don't have love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. All of my eloquent, angelic speaking in tongues is meaningless chatter. Is what he's saying. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, I win Bible trivia every time. And if I have faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. I can have faith that moves mountains but if I don't have love, then I have nothing? Yes, you have nothing. And he finishes with this, if I give all the possessions, if I give all I possess to the poor... And give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. In other words, I can have all these gifts. I can have this gift of tongues and, and this gift of knowledge and understanding. And, and then I can, I can even give sacrifice. I can give everything I have to the poor. And I can live a life of hardship. But if I don't love, it's meaningless. It's so easy in the church to fall into the trappings of being a gifted person that serves, to being a person who just, I mean, I'm just consuming everything that Scripture wants to teach me. I'm, I'm, just, I'm learning about Jesus, learning about Jesus. Oh, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving, oh, it's, I'm sacrificing. But without love, it's all meaningless, nothing. And so then, then Paul drills down into what this kind of love looks like. And I want you to be clear on this. This love looks like Jesus. This love that he describes, this is Jesus. This is graciousness. This is sacrifice. This is all the things we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. This is Jesus. I've read this passage so many times in marriage, in, in like a wedding. You may have been to a wedding and heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Very, very popular. And, and so we tend to think about it like in, in, it's like some sort of romantic notion. It's like, it's like something you hear at a wedding. But I want you to understand that this is not talking about marriages or romance. This is talking about love in the way that we're supposed to love because this is defining the way Jesus loved. 
So, but I also want you to hear this clearly too. I'm not saying if you had it read at your wedding that that's wrong. It wasn't wrong that you read this at a wedding. What's wrong is you didn't apply the same standard to every other relationship in your life. That's the part that's wrong. Is this a standard for a good marriage? Yes. You love like Jesus in your marriage and your marriage is going to work. But you love like Jesus with your siblings or with your parents and your family relationship is going to get along. It's going to work. You love like this with your friends and you're going to be a friend that, that people want. You love like this with, with uh, you know, colleagues at work. You love like this with, with classmates at school. You're going to be a person of influence. There are going to be people who want to hang out with you if you love like this. Because this is not just love for marriages. It's not just romance. This is a love for every context of our life. This is what he says. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not, is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. In summary, let me, let me just summarize all that I'm going to talk about today. And this is what I've, I've come to glean from my week with this passage and just kind of tearing apart 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I'm going to look like Jesus... If you and I are going to look like Jesus, loving people in the way that he did, then I have to lose my priority for living a trouble-free life. If, if I'm going to love the way he loves, if I'm going to, you know, be like him, then I've got to lose this idea that, 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 that God's ultimate goal for me, that his will for me is to have a trouble-free life. I've convinced myself, maybe you've convinced yourself too, that God's desire for you is to, is to be trouble free. And that's not at all the describe, what he describes here. Matter of fact, I've gone so much and so far that I kind of crave the trouble free life. Anybody else? I, my son just moved to Nashville yesterday and we spent the last couple of days kind of packing him up and helping him move. And, you know, as a parent, you're like, okay, dude, what part of. Packing, did you not understand? Like, you know you're moving, right? Why are, why are we packing? You should have been packing. You know, it's like, why am I carrying this burden for you, my son? Um, and, and so after, after helping him, like I was like on the way home and we were thinking about dinner and, you know, we talked about how, you know, we're, we got to stop eating out. Yeah, we got to stop eating out, okay. But on, on the way home, I'm like, I just want to grab something. I'm tired. I don't want to make something. Because it's like convenient. As we were moving him out, we, we, I noticed he's got a crock pot, never opened. Crockpots never open. Why? Because we're Instapot people. I mean, we don't we don't crock anymore. That's like it takes like eight hours. We're Instant Pot people, and we want now, right? Convenience. But this it's the nature of the way our our society's kind of gone. It's the way I've gone in COVID. During COVID, I've, I've been home a little bit more, and so I've been taking out a little bit more of the cooking. So I, I've come to appreciate now when I look at recipes. I look, the first thing I look at is the prep time. Anybody else with me? If it's like 45 minutes, it's a no-go. That's a non-starter. That's a non-starter. 30 minutes, ah, maybe. 15 minutes, I'm in, right? It's like this is talking my love language now. It's like dump, 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 stir, lid go on. Okay, perfect. But here's the danger, like when it comes to relationships, I think social media has become so popular with us. And I don't know if this is a... The, the reason social media has become popular or if this has become a trend because of social media. But I've noticed that I can do relationships much wider but a lot less deep. Anybody notice that? Like I, I can be involved with so many more people and yet not very deep. I, I can window shop on the lives of my friends. I can keep up without putting much investment in the relationship. It wasn't true in the past. In the past, like if you wanted to know some things about people, you had to actually sit and listen to them. You couldn't just peruse from the outside. And I think this is the danger in social media is that we end up with, with, with relationships that are very, very wide, but they're not very deep. And the, the relationships here that are described, this isn't the trouble-free life. The, the, way, the way Paul describes this, this is not trouble-free relationships. As a matter of fact, I cannot love like Jesus and live a trouble-free life. That is not God's will for me if I'm going to look like Jesus. It just isn't. And it was, it was a tough pill for me to swallow this week as I was looking at relationships and recognizing 
that there's no way, in, in the way that God's economy works, in the way that his relationship criteria for me works, there's just no way I can enter into trouble-free life if I'm going to do life with people. And, and how, you can say, well, how do you know that way? And how do you know for sure that's what God has? Because here's, here's the way Paul starts. It, you know, in my first uh, point, my first case here for this case against why we can't have a trouble for wife. This is, what he, this is what he starts with. I mean, would you start with this? Love is patient. That's the first, you're going to start with that? You're going to lead with that? Why do, you, why do you lead with like love never fails? It always trusts, it's always protects, it's always so good, it's fuzzy, it's warm. Always has your back. No, he starts with love is patient, which is a way of saying you will suffer in relationship. That's how you start? Love is patient? Yes, that word means, the word patient, that, he, that we translate patient, I think we've kind of like um, sanitized the word, because he basically says, like, love is long-suffering. That's what that word means. In a relationship, you will suffer a long time. Are you in? That's how it starts. Like, love is patient. So in, in a relationship, if I'm going to do relationships the way Jesus did relationship, it means I'm going to suffer. And it's not just suffer the circumstance around relationship. This is suffering with the people we do relationship with. This is talking about the people that we love, not the circumstances. This isn't like just like, yeah, that was a little bit annoying, like we're getting to this COVID thing, but pretty soon relationships are always going to be, once we get past this, it's just going to be warm and fuzzy. No, it's not. It's going to be hard. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be hard to do life together. It's always going to be hard. We're always going to have to long suffer. There's always going to be somebody that's a little disappointing. There's going to be somebody that's like a little bit trying. There's going to be somebody that we have to walk with and we're going to have to walk with and we're going to have to walk with and we're going to root for it and we're going to root for it. But they are going to drain us a bit. Some of you are in, in marriages where this, is, this has been the battle. You feel like you're, 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 you're wanting and you're, and you're longing for more and you're wanting for more and it's long suffering. And that is love. It's like a farmer who plants a seed and then waits and waits and waits for the payoff. That's love. Love is patient. Now, I want you to hear this. In, in, in saying this, I, this has been one of the, I think, one of the tragedies in the church is that sometimes people feel like because we read things like this that, that, that I, could, I, I have to stay in, in a potentially abusive situations. And, and this is not a, a reason to stay in an abusive situation. That's not what I'm saying. But relationships are hard. And sometimes when you're in a relationship, especially if it's abusive, I want you to hear this. Get separation. You get yourself out of that situation. But you continue to love. You continue to root. You still continue to pray. Continue to, 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 to commit to a marriage even when you have to step out of it for the sake of, uh, of an abuse situation. Do not stay in it. But don't give up on it. But that's true for relationships too. Any relationships, we, we tend to want to choose the easy ones and not the ones that are so trying. But relationships like this are, it starts with long suffering. Love is patient. He goes on to say that love is kind. This one's an easy one for us, right? Because love is kind. That's just like, like being caring and, and comforting and compassionate towards one another. Now we kind of know that. That's our assumption about love. It's easy. At least easy to understand. But then he goes on to say this, that love does not envy. And this one's like one of the hidden ones. I think there's problems with us sometimes about envy and we just don't want to own it. It just kind of lurks in, in somewhere in the closet and, and it's like behind, like in the shadows and it has influence on us, but we just don't want to recognize it. But this happens when, when somebody gets something good and this little evil thing then crawls out and, and it doesn't allow us to rejoice when something good happens to someone else. And it happens all the time. And it happens very subtly. I've, I've noticed, like, I, I've quit. I, I don't always feel safe to post my vacation pictures anymore. I, I used to post them for the sake of my family, for my, my kids, so that they could see things we're doing. But I recognized that they were, when, I, when I made them public, that, that not everyone rejoiced. And, and some people became a little bit bitter that I was able to do something and they weren't. And I see this sometimes. We've noticed that like the last few weeks, right, as it got like, we were like minus 37 here. And then somebody's like, hey, it's sunny and 80 in Florida, right? And, we're, and then you see someone's comments, oh, I'm so jealous. Ha ha. You know, and it's like they put the ha ha to kind of hide the fact that, no, I'm really jealous. I'm going to hide the truth here behind my ha ha. No, oh, you probably are a little bit jealous. But, but like love does not get envious when something good happens to someone else. It, it's able to rejoice. 
So I had somebody one time come to me and they were like, they were looking at what I was doing and they were looking at somebody else was doing and they were like, does it seem right that they make as much as you? And I'm like, why would I want less for someone else? Like what kind of a heart? And in that moment, I, I no, I would not want to take away from someone else. No, like what? Why would I rejoice with someone suffering? I know, I'm, I'm glad that someone would be on equal footing with me. It doesn't make me mad. But I have to watch it because there's times when, when I do, I, this little thing creeps out of me, this little envious thing, and I can look at somebody, what somebody else has, and I think, oh, man, why did I choose to be a pastor, right? I could, I could have had that or I could have done that. And it, 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 it's just this little, but love does not do this. Love does not, uh, it's not envious. Love does not boast. So in the same way that it's envious, sometimes it's the boasting in the posts that make it hard for people who struggle with envy. Because you know, some, some of you know this, like when, when you post things, you're doing it because you're like, hey, hey, you know, I, I just put this out here casually, but look at me. I just want to share, but look at me, look what I got, look what I got to do. And it doesn't help those who struggle with envy. Love does not elevate itself by calling attention away from others and onto itself. Love does not do that. Love does not boast. Bragging and boasting is, is when, when we brag and, and we boast about things, it is like literally like we're trying to do is climb the pile of people and put ourselves on the top. Love is not proud. It's not puffed up. That's what the word proud means, puffed up. In other words, love, love doesn't get so puffed up that it has to be seen as, as, as over someone else. Like love doesn't do that. Love is not full of itself that, that others are diminished or made less. And love does not dishonor others. So like if you're listening to someone and someone is saying something negative about someone else, don't listen to it. Like call it out. Tell somebody, hey, I don't want to hear that. Why do I want to listen to that? Why do I want to participate in dishonoring someone else? How is that love? Well, somehow I, I feel better about myself if I can tear them down. That's not love. Love is not self-seeking. It doesn't seek its own interests above the interests of others. And it puts others' interests as first importance. Love is not easily angered. It doesn't make everybody walk on eggshells. It's not like easily like upset. It's not like super sensitive and, and, and read into every word and nuance and make everybody feel like they can't speak. No, no, love doesn't do that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't keep rubbing its nose in people's mistakes. Love doesn't do relationship in a way that looks back always, that like looks at the heart, the, the hurt that was caused and, and keeps reminding someone of the failure they were uh, to them in a relationship or they were, the failures they were in life. Love doesn't do that. But it's so often in the church where we can't see past someone's history. When the example of Jesus is that that is like dead and gone. Like the, that, that old life that we celebrate someone's walking in. Oh, yay, new life. But don't forget who you used to be. What? There's no part of Jesus like that. But we do it all the time. We let people, this is the thing I was talking about like with forgiveness last week, of letting people walk outside of that, to, to leave it alone, to, to not bring it up. That in Christ we are new creations and that old has gone. So love allows it to go, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. So when there's imagined acts of evil, this happens all the time. I was talking with one of my staff people because I'll say, hey, um, hey, can I get some time next week with you? I'll just say that to one of my staff people. And then all weekend they'll be like going, oh, what's he want to talk to me about? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like this thing. And we have these imagined like, oh, it's going to be bad. Or somebody will, 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 will text us something and, and we'll read the text. And, and we don't know the context of the text really. We don't know how they said it. But we'll assume it was the worst and we imagine acts of evil because there is an evil one who lies to us all the time and wants to destroy everything good in our relationships. And he does this by, by creating these evil, negative dialogues about, you know, and, and, and it's not truth. But we rejoice with the truth. We, 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 we see the truth and we, we like rejoice with it when, when our relationships are based on truth. So if you think that you understand what somebody meant when they wrote that thing, if you haven't talked to them, you're delighting in evil, not truth. 
If you're allowing somebody's post about something and you're reading into what they posted and, and their heart behind it, and, and you, are, you, are, you are allowing evil to trump truth. Spend time with each other. Dialogue. Learn to understand each other. Because you'll find that most of the time their heart was not what you think it was. And their intention wasn't. Sometimes it is. But you'll delight with the truth when you know. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love never fails. Love has this way of looking at people's potential and believing in their potential. Love always protects. It always believes that, like, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chalk you up to your failures, but I'm gonna protect you from yourself sometimes. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand with you when you fall. I'm gonna protect you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna elevate you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure that, hey, look, you can always trust me. I'm always in your corner, and I'm always gonna believe the best things in you. I'm gonna help you realize your your potential because I'm gonna hope in you. That is love. And that kind of love never ever fails. But the truth is that kind of love is hard. And if we're just relying on our natural, native love to get the work done, it's not going to get it done. Because that kind of love is conditional, it's fickle, and it's not trustworthy. In moving my son, we were packing up some of his furniture. and There were some things that had to be kind of put together. And, and so I was like, hey, uh, I want to tie these things together. So do you, you have any rope or any kind of you know, bungee or anything? And he's like, no. I'm like, okay, you got anything that will hold things together? And he's like, I got these. And so he produces these Velcro things that are made to hold cables together, you know, kind of like to tie these things up. And so he hands me a stack of these. I'm like, awesome. It's true. They, these things hold things together and, and then and they hold things, you know, and so like, I would, I would fashion this to like our own ability, right, our own will. Like if, if there's cords, we might be able to you know, grab some different parts of our life and kind of hold it together and kind of like hold it together and it looks like it's all well put together. But when we start to like encounter some sort of difficulty, which we will encounter difficulty, we don't have the strength to do any kind of work. Because when, when I started to move furniture that was strapped together with this, I created this little rope here by, and, and I tried to move something, some sort of object that actually had some sort of weight to it. It couldn't stand it. It couldn't take it. And here's what, I, here's what I concluded, right? And so I asked him, I said, hey, can I borrow some of your Velcro straps, buddy? There are so many parts of our life that we rely on our own strength and our own understanding. And it creates a very, very weak support. So like for our happiness, we say, look, I, I'm, I'm feeling good. I, I want to feel good about my happiness. And so we look at our own health and, and our own health is the standard by which we gain our happiness or our happiness is based on. And it's a very, very weak wire to hang your health on. Or, or we look at like um, our, our security and our finances and we think, you know what, like I, 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 want, I want security so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna try and cobble together more savings. I'm going to make sure I have everything I want for my, my nest egg because I, I want security. And then it's just a very, very weak wire to hang my security on if I'm looking at my finances because it, it can just be a little downturn in the market. Uh, it can be a correction of 30%. It can be COVID that's going to wipe out a business for a year. And suddenly that's a pretty thin wire. And I'm telling you, the same thing is true for love. If we think that somehow we're going to be able to love like this on our own understanding and our own ability and our own strength to hold things together, there's going to be some things, like the first relationship you get into that, that's going to require something of you and you're going to try and do the loving on your own, you're going to find that it can't do much. That's just the truth. Like the only way, the only way that you and I are going to love the way we need to love like Jesus is if we just fully surrender the process that look, what Jesus wants to do is love through us. And the more that I die to me and allow him to live in me, the more I might possibly love like him. So gone is my notion of a trouble-free life. Because living like Jesus is not trouble-free. Living like Jesus means loving like him. And it was not trouble-free. So I, I like to fashion it maybe a little bit more like this where he's just saying, look, I just, want you to, I just want you to kind of hold on tight here, Wayne. I don't want you to do the lifting. I just want you to hold tight to me. And you hold tight to me. And, 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 and this is... Kind of convoluted, and I got to find the right thing. I'm sorry, but the idea is like when we just hold tight. The truth is like he does the lifting. He's the one who does the heavy lifting, not us, because in my own strength, there's no way that I can move this. 
There's no way that I can love like him. There's no way that I can be patient the way that he would be patient. There's no way that I can be, uh, you know, free of envy the way he would be free of envy. There's no way that I could, I could like, rein in this thing of boasting and pride and all these things that I want to do to elevate myself because I am self-seeking in and of myself. Only by surrendering him and dying to myself will we ever lift this heavy burden of loving each other the way we should. Should have brought the 15-pound, not the 20, right? That's like, everybody's like watching to see. Like, oh God. I, so I still sat, sat backstage. I want to make sure when I was lifting this, I wasn't like, oh God, you know. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for Jesus and I thank you for loving us like this. Surrendering yourself, not being self-seeking. Lord, I'm reminded of you in the garden when you're saying, look, not my will, but yours. Because your will, your flesh was crying out for itself in the same way mine does. And yet you were able to let go of it and set it aside. Lord, I pray for each of us that we would examine ourselves, that we would examine our, our, our ability to surrender to you and allow you to love through us the way that you desire to. That we would truly be your disciples because we would love each other the way you love, you loved us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, Malachi is going to sing a song here. And I, I have this challenge for you. We've been doing these practical challenges. And here's, a, here's the challenge I want to give you guys. This week, I, I would encourage you to either, there's two choices you have, or you could do both. But one would be to like, to make a commitment, a long-term commitment to pray for somebody that you have been an enemy with. In your mind, you've created an enemy. You, you've created, you may not call them that, but that's what they are. Every time they speak, every time you're around them, there is this air of bitterness that you've been caring about them. I would, I would encourage you to pray for them. Or someone that you just, you, you've intentionally not engaged with. Commit to pray with them. That would be the first challenge. The second challenge that you have a choice in would be this. And that is to consider who's missing from your group of friends. We tend to surround people, ourselves with people that are easy to love. They're like us. Uh, they speak good things to us. They, you know, they tend to be people that build us up as opposed to us always having to pour into them. But consider those around you and then and people that are different than you. They may look different. They may come from a, a different background. They may be from a social, socioeconomic different place than you are. And it may be a difficulty for you to even enter into a relationship but it might be a great step for you to learn to love somebody that's different than you. So those are the two challenges. And as Malachi sings today, I pray you just meditate on which one, which of these do you need to take on. See, as Wayne said, as we <clears throat> do this last song, just use this as a time of reflection for you pretty confident it's probably a song that most of you have not heard before. This is uh, from a singer-songwriter that um, I really love his music, and I had a different song plan for this uh, end of service today, but I really, just my mind kept on drawing me back to this song. It's called More Like Love. We all have so many things going on in our head and our hearts right now, and I just want to be more like love. I want to look more like love. We can have all of these opinions and things to share and soapboxes that we can get on, but at the end of the day, if we don't look like love, then, then it's all for nothing. So that's the encouragement of this song, is that we could look more like love. The 
Listen, as we uh, get ready to say goodbye, I want to encourage those of you listening or watching from home today just to con uh, have a conversation around these two challenges and which one you chose and why. For the sake of accountability, for the sake of just conversation about why you chose these, maybe you have to go into detail, but at least share with people the decision you made and why, maybe what God's teaching you. We're going to let you guys go. I want to encourage you to join in the chat. If there's prayer requests today, please let us know either through the chat or you can go to our website and let us know. We want to be praying for you. God bless you guys. If you're in the room, I want to remind you, the registration you received has a, a link. If you do uh, test positive this week, please let us know. All of our contact tracing, we will continue to do that as we make changes to our services in this room. We aren't having registrations and the room won't be set up specific to registrations, but we will continue to do contact tracing, which is all voluntary. People let us know voluntarily if they, if they test positive, and then you can opt in voluntarily if you want that information about who was in the room. And so we'll continue to do that. Every week you have the opportunity to opt in to contact tracing or not, okay? Just want to let you guys know that change is coming. So next week, no registration. You can go, go to our website. Go check it out. Go look around. But don't, you don't have to register. So that's the good news. I want to pray for us as we leave. Okay, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for Jesus and I thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. And I pray that we would just be encouraged to love like you and to look like you more. And next week as we finish this series talking about what it means to like practically look like you. Uh, I pray that you continue to work on our hearts. May we surrender our hearts to you and have, may you have your way with us so that we can love like you more. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.